just a few more seconds as the internet connects us to the interweb. All right, so here we are and hello everyone. Welcome back to the Sisters Bond in Action webinar series. I'm Ayana Young and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Today we'll be discussing direct action from the grassroots with Malia Holman and Heather Milton. All right, so oh, let me close that. And um, so as we're all compelled to stand for the earth and all of its inhabitants in the face of this global extinction crisis and ubiquitous injustice, we must find the strength and courage to tangibly and effectively act. Although it is scary to truly acknowledge the gravity of our current reality, the safety of passivity and non-action is an illusion. The truth is, we are in danger, whether we remain in a state of denial or not. The web of life on this planet is unraveling at a rapid pace. Climate chaos will only escalate. People everywhere continue to face both violent and indirect forces of oppression. And if we do not let fear immobilize us, we can find that excitement um, that fulfillment, uh, belonging, that empowerment that emerges when we stand together as relatives and kin in honor of what is sacred and just. So today we are so honored to be with Malia Holman and Heather Milton Lightning. Malia Holman is an environmental activist, Hawaiian native, water protector, and indigenous woman. She joined the Standing Rock Sioux on the front lines against the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline in the face of human and environmental rights violations. Through changing the culture of disregard and disrespect of nature and indigenous people, her goal is to create a renewable and sustainable future for coming generations. A lifelong steward of native treaty lands and sovereign rights at home in Hawaii, she is an organizer with the Mauna Kea movement, which is halting construction of the world's largest telescope on Hawaii's most sacred mountain. Her commitment to preserving the Hawaiian language is motivated by the similar suppression faced by Native Hawaiians and other Native Americans, including silencing of Native language, theft of the most fertile land, seclusion of low-income areas, and the robbing of ancestral diets. While canvassing for the Bernie Sanders campaign, she traveled across the country with Up To Us, developing solutions with communities throughout the United States, organizing the Respect Our Water, an indigenous youth movement, brought her to the front lines of Standing Rock where she endured violence by law enforcement with less lethal weapons. She was maced three times at Standing Rock. Each time she says, it definitely does not get any better and face snipers. Malia brings what she's learned from Standing Rock movement to nationwide goals such as adopting sustainable energy and continuing to live a life of pono of right or righteousness, as is said in Hawaiian. She inspires people to continue on the path towards permanently halting the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline through the Missouri and Cannonball Rivers despite setbacks and losses. She inspires other women towards leadership with consideration for their neighbors for the planet. Heather Milton Lightning it has 17 years of organizing experience from local issues to in international campaigns. Heather has a founding, is a founding member of Native Youth Movement that empowered youth 
politically and socially to make change in their communities based in Winnipeg, Manitoba in 1995. She helped found Winnipeg's first native youth organization called Aboriginal Youth with Initiative Inc. in 1998 through her position as associate director. Heather then went on to found and build a national native youth network and supported native youth organizing across the US and Canada with the Indigenous Environmental Network based in Northern Minnesota. She was a former member of the United Nations Environment Programs Youth Advisory and has extensive experience in lobbying internationally through the United Nations and other international arenas on Indigenous peoples issues. Heather's work since has been to build capacity and find resources to help local Native communities from funding board participation on the funding exchange, Saguaro Fund, and Honor the Earth, to helping build the Indigenous People's Power Project through the Ruckus Society that trains on nonviolent action, direct action tools. Heather currently is the co-director for the Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign out of the Polaris Institute in Ottawa, Ontario. Wow, thank you both so much for your work in the world and for joining us tonight and sharing a bit with us. So thank you and welcome. Mahalo. <laughs> um, Heather, so, do you want to go first or something? Yeah, so I'm going to just um, start off by wanting to ask you both and please, you know, decide whoever would like to go first, but the work you do embodies the willingness and the courage needed within movements of resistance. And amidst a dominant cultural framework rooted in pervasive violence, it seems that a major challenge and necessity as leaders and organizers is to remain grounded and inspired. So I'm wondering if you could both share with us a bit about your personal journeys within the realm of this work and how you cultivate strength and inspiration despite mm -hmm. the disheartening and um, destructive realities of the world? Um, I just kind of want to clarify, just because um, I'm actually not an organizer of Mauna Kea. I just participated in it. And again, with respect, our water was not an organizer as well. Um, but with Up To Us did organize rallies for the runners in DC and New York. Um, but Respect Our Water and Mauna Kea are beautiful entities with amazing organizers whom have inspired me. Um, so touching on the grounding part, that's a really great question. I, uh, grounding for me absolutely started through Mauna Kea and through what Auntie Pua um, explains it as kapu aloha. And since Mauna Kea is our sacred mountain, there was no other way to hold ourselves um, accountable for our actions than kapu aloha, which means a firm commitment to pono, a firm commitment to what we know and believe as righteous, as right, as true, as good. Um, so without the mauna, I honestly don't know how much strength uh, um, in regards to grounding I would have had at Standing Rock because of the severity in regards to violence. Um, so I, I owe a lot, a lot of that to it. Finding strength is definitely difficult and I'm not always strong. There are t many, many times where I'm completely weak and drop to my knees, dropping tears, emotionally distraught, and I think, I think we all have to recognize that we will come to those states uh, within movements and it's okay. It's very natural. And if we don't, then we're not truly recognizing our feelings. And I feel like that's, that's dishonoring our souls first and foremost, ourselves secondly, and the movement thirdly. Because if we're not truly looking within ourselves to really, um, reflect upon everything that we're dealing with emotionally mentally physically spiritually um then we can't really guide our actions in a good way so that's that's kind of my my take on it 
Thank you, Malia. And I'd love to hear from you, Heather, on this. All right, sorry about that. Um, let me switch the camera a little bit. There you go. Um, grounding, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing I'll say is that the idea and the terminology that people always talk about is um, you know, this idea of activism and all these other like terminology organizer, like all the, the campaigning frame that NGO world uses, like the non-government profit organization, whatever you want to call it, world uses. Um, I mean, I use a lot of that language myself. Um, but I think when it comes down to like this idea of like who you are, where you come from, um, that's always really challenging for me. And I think part of it was, is I was adopted. So I was a part of the, the 60s and 70s scoop. Um, that was a government policy in Canada to take our children away. And so I made my way home. And a part of that was also like being politicized as a young person when I was 17. And it just taught us to question the world around us. And I think that's really important is the idea of being able to critically think about why things are the way they are. And like in 1995, Winnipeg, was this is the first time we've seen native gains in our country and they were increasing by 300% and the media just made it better. Um, they, they helped that process along. Um, we've seen a lot of child and prostitution in our communities, you know, drugs, sniffing, the whole nine yards, but we were really trying to understand why. And that goes back to this idea of colonization and knowing our own history. And I had the privilege of going to Children's Earth High School in Winnipeg and it's one of the first native high schools in a school district in the country. And it was founded by activists, of course, and ceremony people. And, you know, so the first couple of years of curriculum, it just turned out a whole bunch of youth activists. And that's how we founded Native Youth Movement. And so a lot of, like, the folks from Standing Rock that came down from Canada, um, you know, that were in a lot of, like, the Red Warrior camps and stuff like that, they come out of Native Youth Movement. I thought it was really interesting because, like, I was 16 when we founded it. Um, but I think the thing that we learned that was really valuable is that there was a disconnect. Like for me, it was deeper because I was raised outside of the community, but for a lot of the young people I work with or that I was organizing with at the time, we were just disconnected and not on purpose. Like our families made a choice to move to the city because they couldn't, life wasn't good on the res. You know, they wanted a better livelihood, but that meant a disconnect from the land, from the culture, from the ceremonies and all of those things. And so a part of us decolonizing at that time, which we didn't use those words, we were just trying to figure out who we were and we were trying to understand the world. And then we started learning all these things. It made us really angry. So we started doing actions. And a piece of that is we walked across Canada. And the only reason we did that is because my friend had a five-year-old son and her and her son had a dream to go to the ocean. And that's really how Native Youth Movement was born, was out of a ceremony and out of a dream. And in our cosmology and in our history, like that was the most important thing as a young person that you could do is to have a vision because it sets the course and the foundation for who you become in your life. And we don't do that anymore in our communities. We don't, we don't carry ceremony in the same way. And that goes back to this process of colonialism, right? Like those, those important pivotal moments in our life are, aren't as celebrated. And I think that's something that's starting to come back in our communities. But even that way of thinking, like, we need to go out and fast and seek our vision for to become who we are as better people. That's not a part of our lives anymore. And so I think for me, this idea of groundedness goes back to the idea of responsibility. And that's something that I learned that I share with people a lot is that for young people, they have a really important responsibility. Um, and it's to go out and learn to try new things, to critically think and look at the world around them, but also to learn from people and pick up as much knowledge as humanly possible. And part of when we were learning, you know, we, we, we showed up at warriors ceremonies at places that we weren't exactly invited, but we just showed up because we wanted to know. And we asked people to teach us how to be good leaders and they didn't. Um, they kind of just ignored us. And the people that really loved us were grassroots mamas. You know, people that seen the value of young people being active and being political, but also questioning the world. Um, and I think that's really important. And I hope that young people today still have that analogy like we need to question the world but we also have a responsibility in our lives to do good things but to build upon the generation before us and so for my generation the generation before us was like red power american indian movement like all of these movements right and so we we seek them out um we asked them a lot of questions we visited with them we tr really tried to learn from them and um part of that learning process was understanding that it's our responsibility to take what they did and move it forward and continue to make these incremental steps 
of undoing all the things that we've seen wrong in our communities. And that's a part of our responsibility as to continue the work of our ancestors um, and to keep moving forward. So I would say when, when it comes to this work, it's not just about like, um, you know, being an activist or being a spokesperson or any of these things. It's because it's our responsibility as, as Anishinaabe people, as people of wherever we come from, our responsibility is to take care of the land, but also to do good things to help our communities. And as young people, that's a responsibility that every young person has too. You know, and us older folks, is once you get to be middle age, you have to figure out all the lessons you learn and figure out where you fit in this life, right? And so I'm in a different stage now, and I think that's fun and that's cool, but it's also really challenged me to think about, like, critically about my own self and the things that I've learned. And I think being in Standing Rock really taught me a lot of things. It brought out the worst in me at times, and it brought out the best. And I think everyone has had a different experience from what, what they've learned down there. Um, but I think in terms of groundedness, it's just going back to our ceremonies, the way that we conduct ourselves in the world, and what we really firmly believe, right? And... I come from a crew of young people that learn those things and not, not because anyone really taught us, we just, we just decided to go get it. And I feel like a lot better that things have hopefully changed, that it's not so hard for young people to go learn about their culture or who they are when they feel disconnected, that there's easier ways and pathways to learn about these things. Because that's the way it should be and that's really what we fought for was, was to learn who we are and not have it be hidden in books and, and places that we couldn't get it. And, in, and the knowledge of our elders that we couldn't even go see because we had no access to. Well, thank you both of you so much for those uh, deeply felt heart, felt responses. And um, there's a lot to chew on there. And I wanna kind of dive now into um, direct action uh, tactics. And, you know, I'm thinking that within movements of resistance, there are many different opinions on the proper tactics to employ. And I was hoping that we could just kind of break down and discuss three of the common approaches, nonviolent direct action, small scale resistance in your community, such as growing your own food and medicine, and then the more forceful strategies such as monkey wrenching in which industrial equipment or infrastructure is targeted. And so I'm wanting just to open up the floor and hear from you. Um, what are your opinions on the strengths and weaknesses of these different methods? And maybe even um, if you have any personal stories of these. Cool, I guess, I guess we'll just go with the, um, the pattern that we have going on right now. Um, that's, you know, the strength about small scale resistance, like you said, such as growing your own food and medicine, is that it can happen anytime and all the time. You know, of course, depending on your, your environment, um, what you can grow during your seasons and whatnot. In Hawaii, we're blessed with being able to grow things uh, year round. And that should happen, I believe, first and foremost, in my mind. Um, because when you start to grow your own food and your own medicine, you're putting your hands into the soil. Your microbes are sharing with the earth's microbes. Your DNA is being shed onto the ground. I mean, it's constantly being shed, but you're physically sharing your DNA with the Aino, with the land, with Papahanaumoku, which is our earth mother. And then you're also furthering your knowledge about the culture with whatever medicine you decide to grow with. Um, in, you know, in Hawaiian, it's la'au, lapa'au. And so when you learn more about your culture, you learn more about yourself. You learn that uh, the way you think, your thought process, um, your grounding, going back to that, and uh, just your inspiration with movements, uh, with policies, with anything is, it can really be traced back to your ancestors, wherever you may be. Just because you are of European ancestry does not mean you do not have a rich culture. You absolutely do. So I think growing your own food, that small scale resistance is something that's easy it's something that's very introductory and is something that 
can be digested um, with everyone on the larger scale. Uh, for nonviolent direct action, I think that really starts with inspiration. You can't really uh, bring a group of people if they are not all on the same page. So whatever you do with nonviolent direct action, I think it really starts with um, getting everybody on the same page, getting everybody inspired, not necessarily in the same way, but with the same context. Because then when you are all inspired and we all know the truths that should be upheld through your nonviolent direct action, your, your action will be unified and that strength will be shown through your actions, um, for lack of better words. I think there's a big weakness in a forceful strategy such as monkey wrenching. I think a lot of people are dissuaded by it um, by just the physical activity of it and how it portrays through uh, social media, through media, um, and just through physically being there and watching it. But it does play a powerful point. And we don't really realize that until the aftermath. So a lot of us, as you see it happening, may think differently about it, may, may be like, oh, no, 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 we shouldn't have done that. That's a wrong idea. But it does carry out its pattern and its purpose for the movement. A lot of the lockdowns, the direct lockdowns that happened in Standing Rock, and I'll just refer to Standing Rock because it's so widely known that a lot of people can um, connect to that. But a lot of the lockdowns, I heard a lot of um, people think harshly about it and didn't really agree with it. But after, after the lockdowns happened, they saw the power that came from them. And yes, in the court system, it can absolutely be used against us. So that's also a weakness that it has. But it's a strength within your own realm and within the movement and the integrity and the inspiration that should take place through, through movements. Because it truly shows that you are, pa you are firm in your belief and you are not afraid. You're not fearful of what may or may not happen if you lock down if you monkey wrench, you're saying, I understand my actions. I am willing to do this. I'm doing this consciously. Hopefully you're doing it consciously or mindfully, or I'm doing this noticeably because without that, I think a lot of people would have been frustrated because there is a level of of grounding within the Standing Rock movement. Again, referring to that since it's so widely known. But um, a lot, you know, there, there were some people who were very peaceful and who could uphold that peace. And that's great. There are others who were shaky in it. And that's still great. And there are others who were constantly mad. And that's still great. There are all levels. And there are and we all have to remember that we all feel a certain way and we're, we all feel so strongly about the outcome, which was to stop the quote unquote black snake. And so if we can all remember that, then every strategy, despite their weaknesses, will absolutely be strengths in the long run. Thank you, Malia. That was a very thoughtful response and I can't wait to re-listen to that on the recording. That was great. Um, and Heather, please take the stage. Okay. Um, so I think this is usually what we call the, the monkey wrench thing is usually fit into like this idea of diversity of tactics. And up here in Canada, um, you know, the military moving in on our people is not unusual. Um, the police presence like there was in Stallion Rock may have not been that big to scale, but it's something that we're definitely used to. Um, you know, I would say the most recent big action by people was to stop frack fracking and seismic testing trucks from moving into their territory. Um, sorry, it's really loud. Um, in Elsie Bookta, um, which is Megamaw territory out east. 
And this new arm of the Royal Canadian Police moved in on their community. Um, you know, there's, I think since 1990 and the Oka crisis, that was one of the biggest times that we've seen the military move in on our people. And so this is not something that's that unusual in Canada to see the RCMP and the military react to land defenders. So it's actually pretty normal. Um, the harassment, you can talk to any one of the folks that came down from Canada, I'm sure they can talk to you about it, about what it's like to be surveilled by the police and followed and have all these records. Like you can do freedom of information and all those kinds of things to find out, but I definitely feel like, um, you know, this is something that's not unusual. We just, it's just not talked about because it doesn't, it hasn't hit the mainstream in the same way that Danny Rock really did, which is a good thing. Um, but it's not something like people keep referencing. I've been going to meetings all over the country lately and everyone sees Standing Rock, but they don't understand like there's like Chaco Canyon, there's uranium development. Like there's so many different kinds of development projects going on across Indian country and not just here in the lower 48, but in Canada in Alaska and in all of the territories like in Hawaii, Puerto Rico and all these other places. And I think the thing that I always think about in terms of land defense is that, you know, particularly in Canada, Canada's going to be 150 years this year, and they're celebrating this big birthday. But Canada's never honored it, its, its agreements to our people in its whole history. It's never upheld its treaty rights. It's never done any of those things. It's done inter incremental little programs and funding and all these other things, but it's never truly honored its word. And I think the thing that people really need to understand is that development and resource extraction were the foundations for colonization. In Canada, the first settlers that came here were the French and the British who fought over the country, right? And they came here for fish. They came here for furs. And that was the first, the first instance that we've seen patriarchy in our communities was the fur traders. Um, it had a deep, devastating impact on our communities, not just by the sickness that spread, but just the different mindset that came to our communities. Um, created a whole new generation of people called the Métis that were a mix of Native and French, right? And this new language, this new culture. So, you know, I really want people to understand that colonization has not stopped. This idea of resource extraction has not stopped. It's just gone further into our territories. And, you know, I think the thing that people need to also understand is that globally, indigenous people make up 5% of the world's population. So we're like 5% of 100% of the globe's population, right? But we maintain 80% of the world's biodiversity. So that's, that's huge. We take care of the earth in a really, really good way that we maintain it. And I think that's something that people really under, need to understand why it's important to work with indigenous people because we're really stewards of our land. And we talk about our first responsibility, but facts and science show it, that we're actually really good at what we say we're doing, right? So when it comes down to this idea of direct action, um, I do a lot of training and part of it is, is that we want communities to be prepared to think about the strategy behind direct action. Because oftentimes we see people roadblocking and trying to stop the companies from coming in. Um, you know, in Canada, we've done a lot of work around the tar sands. You know, the Keystone Excel, the source of the, is the source, um, is the tar sands in Northern Alberta. It's the largest human development project on earth. Um, and that's how big it is. It's big as the United Kingdom, like those, those islands off side of Europe. It's as big as that, the extraction zone right now. And it's, it's projected to quadruple in size, right? And those are indigenous lands, indigenous people that are dying from those projects. But when the Keystone battle happened in the States, people really weren't talking about the fact that it's killing indigenous people at the source, right? And so I think that's really important with the DAPL fight too, is really talking about where's the source of these pipelines? Because if we don't attack the source, they're just gonna put in more pipelines. And that's what we've seen in Canada, is that there's Kinder Morgan that got approved, the Keystone XL, they're trying to push through Energy East, the Northern Gateway, like all of these different pipelines. And it's all from this one little, this one place, which is a tar sands extraction zone, right? And if they can't get out through pipelines, they're gonna use trains. So, you know, in my mind, like it's not just about um, stopping the, the projects itself, it's about undoing capitalism, right? And so one of the things that we've been talking about in the lower 48 is this idea of just transition and really moving out of capitalism or predatory capitalism where our lands are, are up for demolition to the highest bidder, right? Um, and really understanding that when you're talking about small scale solutions, that's what Just Transition is. It's about us taking them back, our food sovereignty, our water, our energy, our housing, all of the basic needs that we need in our communities and providing them for ourselves, right? And, and ensuring that we're not contributing to this global problem of capitalism. 
Because when you take something out of the system, it makes it harder for it to function. So if we have communities all across the country that are able to, to assert their sovereignty and self-determination in terms of providing for themselves, that's a huge act of resistance. But it's also like rethinking capitalism, right? And when I say that, people get really scared because they're like, oh, we can't take down capitalism, but I really think we can. It just takes time and it takes a plan for each community to think about what does it mean to be sovereign and to be self-determining in, in terms of those things. Um, when it comes to nonviolent versus monkey wrenching, as you said, I really think that's a strategy question for communities and for people to decide where they're at. You know, I think even having a conversation around what, what does your community see as violent is really actually really important because we make assumptions that we're all on the same page and that's not true. Um, you know, many people support different kinds and levels of direct action because direct action is huge. Like it encompasses a big thing. And it's not just stopping production, it's doing a variety of different things, like tactically, right? And I think it's up to communities to figure out what's, what's the best thing for them to do. And I think one of the things that we've had a lot of success is going to the places of power. And that's a part of that strategy piece, right? Is that we really have to push, use direct action to push on these targets. So these people that we know that can give us what we want, to push on them and use actions to hold them accountable but to also squeeze them to the point where they have to react, right? And so sometimes that means going to the biggest banks that are vested in these projects with indigenous people from the source of these projects, right? And saying like, you can't do this in our territory, you're violating our rights and so on. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we learned with Elsie Booktook that for every day that people are out on the land stopping the fracking trucks from coming in, it cost the Canadian government $20,000, right? And as soon as people reacted and start, stopped the fracking trucks from coming in, the stock with that company plummeted, right? And so it had an economic impact. And I think that's the thing that we've been telling the Canadian government is that if you don't honor our rights, and if you continue to lease these projects out, we're, we're going to fight back and it's going to cost you money. And I think that's the thing that sometimes we have to get out of asking for, for the companies to do the right thing or the government asking them to do the right thing but actually stopping it, right? And that's, that's kind of the difference. And so, you know, I don't know if that's a good answer, but I really feel like it's up to communities to decide how they view the tactics. What do they see as really strategic? Because in different places, it means different things, right? And it's like what Malia was saying, like some people are, are really cool with, um, you know, going out and doing rallies and protests and ceremonies and jingle dress ceremonies and using our culture as a way to, to spread a message and do an action but they might not be into locking down to machinery. Um, and I think that's the thing that was actually really strategic about, about that idea of locking on some machinery is that it forced the company to stop, for, stop construction for the day, which cost them money, right? And that's all they really care about is the bottom line. Like that's, let's be really honest about that. And I think that's one of the things that has been really useful in this idea of the divestment campaigns is like, like money is power in the US, but also in the globe, right? And I think that's the thing that we've learned over the years through the Tar Sands campaign is that we will go visit the banks, we will visit the pension funds, we will visit the people that own these projects and tell them that you're violating our rights and that Canada has no right to do what they're doing, right? And so some of those strategies have meant that we've asked banks to um, create a corporate, in their corporate loaning structure to implement free prior informed consent, right? Which is the right to say no, but it's also the right to have a really good consultation. And so things like that have been tactically useful and people might not see that as being strategic, but it actually has really worked. And I think that's the thing that we really, we really need people that are creative and that are artistic and that can think outside the box in terms of these strategies, because um, we've been winning, even though we don't see it every day in the day to day we have. And in the Tar Sands campaign, like it is the hu biggest human development project on earth, but we've had these incremental wins. And one of them is like looking back in 2008 and 2007, no one knew what the tire sands was, but they started doing these public opinion polls in Canada and people actually know what it was and they care about it, whether or not it's moving forward. So that says a lot to me that our narrative and the work that we're doing in the media and the actions that we're doing and all the campaign that we're doing is actually working. And I think that's the thing that we need to remind ourselves is it's not for nothing. It can be really tiring. And really hard for people to do this work day in day out especially if you come from those communities where you're seeing your people die of cancer where you're seeing the land being destroyed it's really really hard 
But at the same time, I really want to congratulate the people that are doing this work that are still standing strong, like LaDonna and so many other people that we know because they haven't given up and it's made a difference. And I think that's really important that we really support those that are at the site of development and doing this work. So that was a really long answer, sorry. I'm getting long winded, I'm getting old. <laughs> it, it was wonderful. I loved your long winded response because it was detailed and it really took us through the multi-dimensionality of direct action and that it's not a simple answer and I think it was really interesting to think that uh, think about that um, different people think different things are violent or different direct action strategies are going to work for different communities and it's not just one size fits all and to really come together as a community to strategize and um, and and hear all the voices and and that's going to ultimately make it a more successful action campaign you know whatnot so i i really got a lot from your response and thank you and um i want to now talk about uh recently um the people's climate march and in light of that the people's climate march and the women's march that occurred back in january i'd like to speak about the significance of symbolic action in today's world. You know, although these demonstrations can be powerful and that they hold the ability to unify people as well as educate and bring awareness surrounding an issue, I think I begin to question their potency in actualizing change. You know, as we sit on the brink of climate collapse, in the midst of centuries long sustained violence against the earth and all of her inhabitants at the hands of an unjust and disconnected paradigm, it seems that symbolic action has the tendency to perhaps perpetuate complacency among the populace, wherein the engagement of great numbers of people ends after the march or rally. Additionally, the organization and the implementation of such events expends a large amount of resources that could perhaps be more effectual if utilized to, say, bring people to action in the vicinity of the tar sands, like you were saying, or anywhere else that the destruction is blatantly occurring. So these are just some thoughts that I've been kind of rolling around with lately. And um, I'm wondering, both of you, what your thoughts are on this. and is symbolic action powerful enough when the stakes of what we are facing are so high? And then, you know, secondly, what do you think the benefits of symbolic action in the context of such violent destruction and oppression are? Yeah, um, I actually, I was going through that thought process as well, specifically with the climate march um, in DC that happened. I, I attended the one, um, in Kona on Hawaii Island. Um, and, and again, that was going through my mind as well. It's like, how many marches do we have to do um, for, for actions to start taking place? A lot of my friends were like, oh my gosh, I hope my children do not have to participate in a march. And um, I'm getting that from a lot of the quote unquote veterans who who do participate in um you know actions in in aloha aina work as as we like to call it or protesting or protecting whatever whatever you you want to deem it as um but i always have to realize that i first started because of a march and it was the ku ikapono march back when i was a freshman in high school and just being of native descent and having that that uh, knowledge that was bred into me, you know, through DNA and then growing up in Hawaii uh, among our native people and, you know, protecting the land. Yes. But the, the Kui Kopono March, which, which was a march for Hawaiian rights and Hawaiian lands, um, that inspired me because as I marched, I looked all around. I saw people of different levels within their, you know, protesting realms. I saw people on the sidelines watching and observing and really taking in, absorbing everything that was going on within the march. 
that march has always stuck with me and the the shirt that i got from that march is actually i cut it out and it's on my jacket that i wear to every protest or every movement um because it's my truth it's the truth that has guided me through everything so i do i do understand uh the potency of marches and um I guess I'm just at a point now in in my own uh, realm of Aloha Aina work that I am, I don't want to say done with marches, but I'm just like, okay, I understand marches, um, but now I want to move to the next step. But that's just me. And I think we have to keep slowly, slowly waking up people. And again, um, the more and more you do it, the less and less you're going to feel like it's working because you're already on that next level. But we have to be patient because there's so many of us that are still, um, I don't want, I don't really want to say waking up because my auntie uh, had just taught me about the, you know, the use of, of words and, and how they affect people. But uh, to those who are within that realm of spirituality and consciousness, waking up, uh, to notice so to just notice what's going on the power the peep signs like art art within movement is so cool and just the signs how they develop I, i've seen signs with um at the, the women's march um a woman is saying like i i held this sign up or i marched about this back uh, in the 80s or whatever what have you um how many times do i have to keep doing this and so just to see the artwork to see the signs to hear the chants and then to see the growth it's so amazing it's incredible the people that come out to participate in marches i feel like grow all the time in the Kui Kupono March specifically there was a lot of people um, but for the Mauna Kea March we had an Aloha Aina March um, on Oahu and people or Hawaiians and non-Hawaiians came out from all different islands and there was 10,000 plus people there 10,000 people walking, marching through Waikiki, which is a major tourist destination on Oahu, holding signs, holding, um, you know, cultural staffs, if you will, kahilis or what we call it, tea leaves, um, in, in native clothes, men wearing malos, blowing the, the poo or the conch shell, and chanting in Hawaiian, in English, holding signs, and it sparked something within us just specifically as hawaiians it sparked something within us and our islands i feel like are not the same because of it so again i think we have to be patient with it because of course like i i still am like oh my god like how many marches do we have to do before we can move to the next level and I also le loved, Ayana, how you also suggested maybe going to the like the, the actual tar sands, if you will, um, and and having like a march there. But it's also really important to show face within the cities um, because a lot of the people that you want to target um, and bring on board with you are in the cities because they're stuck in offices, they're stuck in their nine to five jobs, and they're stuck in. Um, the society that's been created and that has been forced upon some of us and you know just born with some of us so i get it i um and i also don't get it so it's it's a it's a balance for me but again um i've just my realm has evolved into wanting to do more so that's all i have Well, thank you, Malia, for that. Just wandering aloud together on this quandary. Um, and Heather, I'd love to now hear your response to this.
Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't get it on the mute. Oh my goodness. Okay, can you repeat the question a little bit? Sorry. Hold on, I, I, I forgot to take myself off mute there. Yeah, so um, I was just kind of touching on the People's Climate March and the Women's March back in January. And, you know, although I definitely see their benefits of, you know, energizing people and coming together and community building, it's still something that takes a lot of resources for people to get to. And, you know, what are we really seeing coming out of these marches? And I, sometimes I even think that sometimes it can keep people complacent because they can go, oh, well, I went to the march, but then what happens? Do they lose that energy? Do we, uh, you know, does something come out of it? So I kind of wanted to hear from you, um, the, uh, you know, what your thoughts are on these symbolic actions and you know what is do you think symbolic actions are powerful enough when the stakes of what we're facing are so high and then if you just want to kind of talk about some of the benefits um, of symbolic actions in the context of such a violent and destructive um, oppressive regime we're under um so I, I think I go both ways on it because here's the thing is that we were under Harper government in Canada for very long, for about 10 years. And he's really, really similar in, in terms of Trump. But I don't want to get it twisted. Like I feel like a lot of the, the, the provincial and government bodies, like they, they just, they've never been really good at holding our rights. I just want to be frank about that in the first place. Um, what I would say is this, is that the birth of I Don't Know More was because of two things, right? It was because one of the chiefs from Attawapiskat decided to hunger strike, and we honestly really thought that she was going to die. She went over 28 days without eating food. And the publicity around that and what she was calling for was that the Governor General and the Prime Minister meet with our people and uphold the treaties, right? It was pretty simple, and that's never happened, because the Governor General is the Queen's representative, the Queen... We signed treaties with actually the British Crown, not the Canadian government. So our treaties are upheld within the Canadian Constitution. So that's that's the clarification I think folks need to understand is that we're a British colony. Um, I think the other thing is that, you know, there was young people and there was folks that just got energized and started doing actions all over the country. And they were really in support of, of Chief Spence and Hunger Strike. But there was also this moment where people were like, screw this. Our rights have been oppressed for a really long time. And what that translated to is a lot of round dances in malls and on the streets and stopping highways and all kinds of different tactics. And a lot of the folks that have been around for 20, 30 years, have been doing this work for a while, were really critical of I Don't Know More. And I thought it was really kind of interesting because they were like, well, where have you guys been? You know, and we're like, well, you know, I, 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 for me personally, like round dancing in a mall was really empowering for a lot of folks. Right. It, it really was it was this is the power community, the round dance community, which is not normally very political. So it was a big deal to see those kind of folks out in malls and doing something. And they were really excited to do it. Like there was a round dance so big in West Edmonton Mall, like it was about 3000 people. That doesn't happen on a daily basis in Canada. Right. And this is the middle of winter. We see people in places in Nunavut and NWT doing round dances in the streets when it's minus 45. Right. So it really motivated people. And I think the thing, the hidden story is that it motivated eight young people to walk 3,000 kilometers out of their community where there are no roads through the bush to come down to Ottawa to meet with the prime minister and to acknowledge Chief Spence, right? And so, you know, I go both ways on it because that was the first time during I Don't Know More where I see my own sisters and brothers get politicized. Because, you know, like, they think I'm just real crazy and I do all this stuff. Like, they don't really get it. And that was the first time, like, treaty rights sunk in. Like, missing and murdered women. Like, that connection with resource extraction. All of those things sunk in for my own family. And that was a big deal. And so sometimes, like, I get it that people don't really support marches. I personally have, a, I get really challenged around it. Because the people, the first People's Climate March in, D in New York City, I believe the price tag on that was something close to $10 million that was spent on that march. And in my mind, I was thinking, if, we, if our people had $10 million to organize, we would shut down the tar sands. <laughs> I mean, we could do a lot in our communities with $10 million, right? And so it's just hard sometimes to be like, this is what the NGO world and the big movements want to do around climate. 
but they don't want to invest in our communities, even though we know that we keep 80% of the world's biodiversity intact, right? So it just means that I think it's an indicator to me, particularly like during the I don't know more time, was that we need to get our shit in, in order, like our house in order, in terms of like if folks are down to round dance, that we need to have like teach-ins and we need to teach people how to organize and build power in communities as a follow-up from these round dances, right? And some of that work did happen. And so we've seen a new generation of organizers come up all across the country, which is really cool. We've seen people reach out from Sami land and from places all over the globe during that time that were really excited and inspired by it. So, you know, there are these little moments, like I feel like Standing Rock did that for a lot of people. It really, it, it challenged people, right? And I think between for us in Canada, I don't know more was the first time that people did actions that weren't necessarily political. And then Standing Rock taught people that doing actions and stopping pipelines is actually okay. Like it created this, this new thinking and, and um, psychological thinking in our community. And that's really good. Because for a lot of the people that have done things like up in the Quetzalcoatl territory and the Onastotan camp and all of these places where there's, there's strongholds of resistance, there's always been this really negative connotation from a lot of our people against folks that are standing up against development projects. And it's really unfortunate that there's such a, dis a disconnect and division in our own communities. And I think seeing people that all across the board from every kind of diverse part of our community is showing up from tribal leaders to First Nations leaders and chiefs coming down and showing their support is a really good thing because it means that standing up against these projects is okay. And for me, that's something that's really important. So getting people from the point where they're willing to go to a march to where they're getting politicized, where they understand how to organize, and then they have a strategy and they're out activating that strategy takes some time. Like it doesn't happen overnight. And for us as young people in Native Youth Movement, like it took us a while to understand what organizing was, right? And to understand like going from this walk across Canada that was really spiritual to actually doing community work, right? And building an organization like in the years after and things like that, like it's a process. And I think that's sometimes the thing that I need to remind myself is not everyone's where I'm at, right? And that I need to be a better organizer, a better trainer to get people to that point in a way that's not so painful because it was really painful for us. It was really hard. Um, and just, you know, even the process of unlearning history can be really hard for someone, you know, and, and our whole country has gone through this process around residential school. And even that was really painful and really hard for our people. You know, and that acknowledgement by the government, even though it was like, I'm sorry, and it doesn't really mean much. It meant a lot for those survivors. But, you know, looking at our communities now, like we're th two to three generations after the residential school and we're still feeling it. So, you know, I think direct action for me is a way to do something with that anger and that energy that could be really positive. Um, I think it's a really good way for people to heal. And sometimes that's, that's what you need. You need a march to gather people. And I'm always reminded of that. Like one of um, the women that has always supported us from day in, way back in the day, her name's Chickadee Richard and she's from... Sandy Bay uh, in Manitoba and she always told me like we need to gather and it's important for our spirits to be together and to get nourishment from each other and sometimes it's just providing that one little moment for us to see each other can be really powerful um, and just really refreshing for our spirits because this work is not easy and a lot of times like we have communities that are flying communities that there's no roads to get to that are really isolated and so being that one family that's trying to stop development can be really isolating. And so sometimes we need these things to see them, to feel them, and to feel inspired by them and know that we're not alone. And I think particularly with our work in young with young people, that's also been really important. It's just reminding people that we're going through the same experience globally, and it's not just in North America. It's not in Canada and the U.S., all over the globe. And so I think that's also really important. I mean, sometimes I'm, I don't like my it's not my favorite thing but you know at the same time that could be someone's first experience right and so we just have to make it the best that it is I think the thing that we've also learned is that we need to use those marching moments as a way to hold movements accountable right because it's the one time that you see indigenous people leading a march in DC or in New York City that we visibilize ourselves and I think for me that's also really important because the US for some reason thinks that Native American people and indigenous people our characters, that we're, we're historic characters, right? That we lived in the past. 
you know, and that we don't exist in the present day and that our treaties aren't relevant and our connection to the land isn't relevant. So for me, that's also something that's really important because we need to remind the U.S. of the power that we have as Indigenous people and remind them to live in a better way on our homelands. Because <laughs> it is our home. And I think that's the thing that those marches provide is that opportunity to visibilize that. And it also helps that celebrities kind of like us in these climate marches and stuff and they come out and stand with Indigenous people. I mean, that just goes back to this idea about this narrative that we have that is really powerful, that we're still here, we're still strong, and we're not going anywhere. And we're activating, again, that, that idea of the first responsibility of taking care of the land. So, you know, I go back and forth on it, but I think there's, there's a realm of, of, of possibility there. But there's also just some critique that I have of myself and our generation that we could have done better on certain things. Thank you both for hashing out this symbolic action question as we're coming into a time where violence is only escalating, extinction crisis is only escalating, and you know we're not seeing the big shifts even when there's so much energy and attention and um, resources from the grassroots people are actually being put into these huge endeavors. And um, so, yeah, thank you so much for kind of getting at that. And I now I kind of want to dive into what happens if you are doing a direct action. And I think that if you're involved in a direct action, and I think it's crucial to bring up that even when you are expressing nonviolence, there's always the possibility of being submitted to violence. You know, for example, the water protectors at Standing Rock and during MACE, frigid high powered water spray and rubber bullets at the hands of law enforcement. You know, although this risk shouldn't deter us, as there is a power in the willingness to put your body on the line for what you deeply care about and what you know is right. But I just want to discuss um, and discuss this. And I wanted to know if you'd mind sharing with us any thoughts you have on this. You know, what should you do when you are met with this unwarranted violence? Ooh, that's a... That's definitely, that's a big one. And um, I guess for me, I really only had three instances where I've met with um, forceful police, I guess you could say. The first one was on Mauna Kea. Um, they, they did so much as pushing. The second one was at the DNC. Uh, they did so little as just corralling. Um, there were, you know, if you, if you did anything more than that, um, they would have, you know, kind of tackled you. And then the third and most intense one, of course, as we all know, is Standing Rock. Um, but I think that we have to stay mindful that that is absolutely a possibility. And if we're ignorant to the fact that that could happen, we're not just putting ourselves in danger. We're not just putting other people in danger. We're putting the movement in danger. Because if you are surprised that it's going to happen and you are not mentally, physically, or spiritually prepared for it, it will come as a major attack to you. And again, how, how do you prepare for that, right? You can't, there really is no, I don't really think there is a, any amount of training that can happen to 100% prepare. But with IP3 that Heather has created um, among other amazing organizers, they I would see them as I was working security at Northgate at camp, I would see them do their direct action training and um, they would have certain organizers, you know, like kind of acting like police and like yelling and whatnot just to try and kind of create the mental environment that you would be the psychological environment that you would be partaking in but with when you're in it when you're actually in it it's a whole different thing and a lot of people have asked me like how, how did you feel when you were when you were being maced like i mean were you scared were you mad and to be completely honest I felt absolutely nothing. 
you know, of course, there's a physical pain of having capsaicin in your eyeballs. <laughs> um, but I was just calm. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why, but a lot of people around me, we were just there because we knew we had to be there. And we knew that if we moved back so easily, um, that we would be disrespecting our truths, which was to stand there. And, and for many of us, we made a commitment, a major commitment within movements um, that said, I will do anything. I will do absolutely anything. And of course, not everybody will say that, and that's okay. But if, if, you, if you say that, you're going to come to a point where you're going to be tested on that. And it's not just humans testing you, but I really believe that it's spirit testing you. And, you know, if, if, if you don't believe in that higher power, that's okay. But it's the universe testing you. It's just something is testing you and really asking you, how far are you willing to go? Um, so you have to realize that that will actually, that will happen. And that's something that I, I wanted to put out within the Standing Rock movement specifically, after I had been maced, I really, really wanted people to know before they came into camp that this is a possibility. Every action that we do is like a 95% possibility that you're going to receive some sort of physical opposition. And you need to be prepared for that. Watch the videos, really ground in in whatever that means to you and ask yourself truthfully ask yourself can i do this can i put myself in in the way of physical violence without reacting um in a way that will not hurt myself will not hurt the people around me and will not hurt the movement Auntie Pua has always told me, do not be detrimental to the movement. And that is something that guides me through any action. And the movement should just be every day as well. Do not be detrimental towards your actions, towards the bigger actions. If you will react in a certain way, remove yourself. Again, it's going back to understanding, recognizing your feelings that you're having. It's so, so important to yourself, your soul, to everybody else, and to the movement. We're all here to portray ourselves as peaceful protectors because that's something that's easily digestible. That's something that can't really be combated um, through discussion with people, through discussion on media, through discussion in court. If you are absolutely peaceful and you are the one taking on the physical violence fingers can't really be pointed at you and then your opposition is stuck because now they look like the ones who are bad or you know what have you they look like the ones who are wrong because why would you want to inflict pain on Americans who are not doing anything who are young most of us were really young um, in the in what would be considered the front lines, um, so I think we need to truly realize that that has been happening throughout the history of being a protector in anything. It has been happening. Police opposition, physical severe violence has been happening, and if we are ignorant to that, we we then become, you know, just, just an obstacle for our, our fellow protectors that have to go around and have to combat upon the many other obstacles that we have to um, uh, get around as well. So I think it's just recognizing that, asking yourself, then testing yourself and putting yourself just a little bit each, you know, each step, just a little bit. Again, with, with the Standing Rock um, movement, me specifically, because I can only speak for myself, I'm really grateful because 
I, I grew with the movement, so I grew with the intensity as well. It was no surprise to me the physical violence that was inflicted upon myself. Um, and again, I'm grateful for that. But if I had just come in, if I just saw it on, on live streams and I had never done or experienced anything like that before, I can only imagine how traumatic and how scary and how shaky that must feel. Um, so if you can if you can include yourself in that a little bit by little and not just go full force, because of course you totally want to be there and you totally want to help and you want to be like, yes, I got that. I got this. But then when you realize when you're there and it's happening to you, you, you're like, I don't know. And I've seen so many people stand there with a deer in the headlights. Like, I don't know what to do. And then uh, us who were security, who were medics, who were people who, um, you were just pervy to it. We had to pull them on the side so they didn't get hurt, you know, so water and canyon cannons wouldn't hit them, rubber bullets, mace wouldn't hit them. To to recognize the the gear that you need, the goggles, the face masks, to to really protect yourself so that you can endure it and you can stay there and you can um build your dictionary, your encyclopedia of what it means to physically take on that violence. So if we can uh, just grow, um, we can we can really benefit ourselves, um, our, our fellow protectors and the movement in the whole. Wow, thank you so much, Malia, for having the courage and the clarity to stand in the face of violence and not only be able to represent your integrity, but also for the movement and for the people around you. And then to be strong enough to be able to hold people that weren't prepared, like you were saying, it's, um, it's really chilling to hear your recount of those moments and seeing you now so clear and focused, continuing on this path is, um, I just have so much gratitude for you. So thank you. And uh, Heather, I'd, I'd love for you to also talk with us about what one would do um, when they are, uh, you know, in a direct, nonviolent direct action, but then receive violence from authorities potentially. And I'd also like, Heather, for you to talk about IP3, which you helped build the Indigenous People's Power Project, which conducts training in nonviolent direct action tactics. So if you could kind of talk about what to do in these um, potentially violent situations and then a, a bit about IP3 and different resources that you use that could be um, valuable in terms of tactics and whatnot. Okay, so that's a lot of questions. I think the one thing that I want to I want to state first is that I feel like the state has always been violent. Colonization is a violent process, and the first form of the Royal Mounted Canadian Police in our territories was to help settlers and to protect them from the native people because they were encroaching our lands. Of course, that was not cool with us because you know they were encroaching on our food, on on all of these things. So I, I really want people to understand that like this idea of violence from the state is not new. It, it takes many different forms. And I think that's also the thing that we try and elaborate when we're working with communities or we're doing trainings is, is to really talk about what that looks like in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, when we talk about like driving while native, right? When we get, when we get profiled by the police, the fact that there are the highest numbers of people killed by the police are actually indigenous folks in the US. Um, it is, shows you what police violence is like in our communities. I think the thing that we understand with resource development projects is that they bring men, men and men and men by the numbers and the violence that, it, that inflicts on our women, our children and our communities. And, and not just like violence in, in terms of like sexual violence, um, but drugs and alcohol and all of these things that come with development, right? And so I really want people to make that connection that it's a historical thing, it's a present day thing, and it happens in our lives and the day to day. And it's something that I'm really challenged around now that I have nieces and nephews that are growing up and they're brown and they're gonna have to deal with state violence. They're gonna have to deal with being profiled. 
And that's a reality in our lives. And I think when we do trainings, we talk about that. We talk about what is what are your triggers when you see police, when you see security, what does that do for you on a psychological level? What are the experiences that you've had? And getting people to share that, to talk about it, and to name it, I think is really important. Um, I think some of the things is we try and stimulate a, com a, a confrontation with police. And we try and keep it as serious as possible. I mean, it's always difficult when you do role plays with folks to get people to take it seriously. Um, we did a training with a bunch of Native young people in Toronto um, before the G20. And people were actually emotional. They were crying. They were really triggered by it. But that was the point. The point was to get people to, to feel the emotions that they feel when they run into the police, when the police are collect, questioning them, when they have a sense of powerlessness and what to do in that moment and how to understand what happens to you. Like, what, what's your trigger point, you know, when you're talking with a police officer, if they're stopping you, you know, I've been stopped on the street for no reason. What does that feel like if you're by yourself? How do you handle it? And then if you're with a group of people, what does that mean? You know, and, and how do we keep ourselves safe? And coming up with a plan with your friends about how to keep yourself safe, right? In, in that situation, and what do you do? Um, it also means like, what happens if you get arrested? What's the process gonna look like? Who do you call? Um, and really demystifying that that whole thing, but really understanding like we live in a society that's embedded with white supremacy, right? And I've, I've been really thinking about this idea of white supremacy the last couple of days. I don't know why it's just stuck in my head. Um, but really understanding that this is the way this system functions. How do we prepare our people to deal with it? And it's really tough. I mean, I think, you know, we, a lot of our, our people talk about PTSD and trauma and like genetic trauma and the things that have happened throughout the generations of our people that lead, led us to this day and age, right? And the fact that we don't just carry our own trauma of, of dealing with places like Standing Rock and other action, but also the trauma of our ancestors and what's happened to our people on a deeper level. And so how do we deal with that? And I think that goes back to that question about groundedness, right? And being prepared. Um, you know, because that looks like, that looks very different in what, in depending on what community you come from. I mean, I think about it um, back east and like to get their warriors ready to go to war, it took four days. They had four days of ceremonies. <laughs> like actually going into a battle was a, a big consideration and there was a long process before the point was where we said yes and then we jumped into it, right? So that would have been a long time ago. Things are very different now. And there's not always the time to prepare yourself. Sometimes it's just reactive. Things happen. But how do you, how do you be ready for that? And I think that's, that's also a really tough question. And I think people really, you know, there's such a strength in our people that we don't talk about a lot. We don't talk about the fact that we're so resilient and we're so powerful and we're so beautiful that we've survived over 500 years of the onslaught of resource extraction and development and the push off of genocide and all these things in our communities that we're still here. And I think that's the thing that I always think about when we're doing actions um, is that our ancestors are with us and they're really proud of us. It makes me really emotional, <laughs> but um, that's the most important thing that we continue the battle that, that was fought by our ancestors and where I come from, like we lost so many people we lost hundreds and hundreds of people during this time um and to this present day it's really different and i think the thing that i also am really mindful is that i've had the opportunity to travel a lot all over the globe and um this spring i went to honduras and we got to visit the communities um that berta Ketres is from who was assassinated by the state and you know, going to Honduras really reminded me of the implicity that the US and Canada have in these countries for their foreign policies and how it's indigenous people that are being assassinated by the state there. And the level of violence in these communities, if you even question anything, or if, you st if you stand up or you say something, your life automatically gets threatened for anything that you do. And I just think, I'm, I really wanna be mindful of that too, that our struggles are connected. And that it's really important that we, we, we enact our first responsibility because we need to help each other globally and stand up for each other. And I think one of the things, like I remember the helicopters flying over, over the camp at night and like the fact that we never got really good sleep there. We were always on edge. We we're always worried about what was gonna happen to us, you know, cause our camp was right on the edge closest to where the police line was and all that other stuff. Um, 
it just reminded me a lot of Palestine. And I got the opportunity to go there with a bunch of um, people of color and other indigenous folks this past summer. And just seeing like the fact that we did an action with some of the leadership from Black Lives Matter, um, with community members from Palestine, and the fact that they were shoving us with their automatic weapons and pushing us and trying to get us off the way. And people were really concerned because they'll use live ammunition on people and they do it all the time. And it means nothing to kill people there. And I think that's the thing that I, I think about a lot is that, you know, the state of violence that we're in in these countries is crazy, but we need to, to push back for those reasons and be mindful of the fact that we fight with each other all over the globe. And this violence needs to stop by the settler state, but we also need to build the solutions to it and be proud that we're still standing strong. So I don't know that that's really a good answer. I really think that it's up to the person individually to think about these things. Um, you know, we try and do our best to prepare people, um, but it's really up to the individual to figure that out. And I think one of the things that we talked about um, was just how do you bring people back from that state? Um, you know, one of the ceremonies that I know the Anishinaabe people have is they have a wiping of, of people that they do, like a ceremony that they do when people come back from war. And it's kind of a lost ceremony, but they're trying to figure out how to bring it back. And that's really important. Like, how do we bring ourselves back from these situations so they're not still carrying that crazy energy from it, right? And just thinking about what that looks like. Because it's different for different communities, um, you know, and, and, and just be mindful of that. But again, you know, we live in a really violent state. Um, you know, the violence is, is, is all around us. And I think we've all figured out ways how to cope with it. But when you stand up and fight against it, you definitely get a pushback from it. You get good and you get bad. So it's just one of those things. Well, thank you, Heather. Um, and yeah, it's, it's complicated. And like you were saying, um, colonization has always been violent and this is nothing new for the native people of this land and for indigenous people worldwide. And um, how to now deal with the weapons that they're using at this point and um, how to stay safe and strategic and working with uh, young children, young people about how to walk through the world knowing that as indigenous youth, this is something that um, is, is threatening and th thank you so much for going into that and i also want to ask that well in addition to the risk of being met with aggression by law enforcement there's also the possibility of being arrested um uh, sorry well, met with the aggression of law enforcement there's also the possibility of being arrested and um it seems that in some situations getting arrested is effective uh, for it can raise awareness surrounding an issue or um, in contrast there are situations when you don't want to get arrested so I'm wondering if you could both shed some light on the role of being detained and arrested and when is it meaningful and also um, you know when is it meaningful how do you know when to stand your ground and then what should you do if you are taken into custody Oh, the rest question. I love it. Um, yeah, so the Standing Rock movement was the first time I have ever been arrested, but been arrested specifically um, in protection um, and in solidarity of a movement. Uh, I honestly thought I was going to be arrested on Mauna Kea and I was willing to do it. Um, and in Standing Rock, it was the same willingness and uh i remember on the way to north dakota as my friends and i were um driving from uh, the east coast we we're driving from new york um my auntie pool totally coming up so often because she's just so amazing so uplifting uh, so grateful for her but she called me and she's like don't get arrested please do not because she understood what would happen and how many times i would have to come back to north dakota um, for all of the court hearings and how expensive that would be just you know 
specifically being from Hawaii. And um, I really took that into consideration. And I was like, yes, auntie, like, you know, of course. But when it came down to it, I realized that I knew what would happen if I did get arrested, uh, meaning I knew what how it would benefit the movement. So my 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 arrest was conscious, and only now I'm I'm really like saying that, like on a live feed or in a video or anything, because my hearing is done. I was already found guilty and whatnot, but I was conscious of my arrest and some people have the benefit of being conscious like they know that they're going to get arrested and they want to do it um some people don't really have that um clarity and they are just pulled you know randomly um so i did it because being within the film industry, I knew what it, it could bring, right? Um, the media loves drama. And, and what does drama mean? You know, what does that look like? That looks like, you know, physical violence, which I absolutely was not going to do on my part to, to, the, to them, to our opposition. Um, and it looks like arrests. And I was like, I can do that. I can get arrested. Did I know what was going to come specifically after that? No, I didn't. Was I prepared for it? Absolutely not. I come, I, I, I come to the Standing Rock with three of my other very dear friends. They're like family to me. I was arrested, and then I had a court date, right? And it was like a month later. I was like, oh, it looks like I'm gonna have to stay because there's no way I'm gonna go back, be it California, be it Hawaii. There's no way I'm going all the way back there and coming back. So I stayed and my friends ended up having to go back, you know, going back to work, going back, doing whatever they had to do. So I was in North Dakota and luckily I, you know, I now have family here and I was staying with them, uh, but I was still very alone. I was the only Hawaiian in a landlocked, you know, place where I'm used to being uh, just waterlocked, right? I'm used to seeing water for days. Um, and I was the only Hawaiian and I felt so alone. So there was so much that came with that arrest and there's so much that I learned from it. Um, I didn't realize that I was going to have like 10,000 hearings that came after the arrest. Really, it was like five or six. I didn't realize that I would be tried with 10 other people who had similar um, charges. You know, most of them were all disorderly conduct. Some had charges, additional charges, but I did not know that our, our jury would be the same jury to decide the fate of each and every one of us. I did not know how much it would cost to be even bailed out, $250, which I am so grateful Chase Iron Eyes and his family bailed me out. Um, I did not know what would come after that. In Mauna Kea, it was very different. When they were arrested, they were placed in holding cells. They were still in their regular clothes that they wore. Um, some of them still had their phones. It was, I don't want to say it was mild at all because that's still very traumatic, you know, within that realm. But if you're going to compare it to what people experienced um, in Standing Rock regarding arrests, it was um, a totally different story. I did not expect being taken into the jail, uh, being strip searched, being told to squat and cough while naked. I remember um, we were all in very good spirits. And at that time, I'm very grateful because the police were actually normal and fair. The booking people were nice. Um, when we got there, um, this lady gave me the good old orange jumpsuit, you know, great uh, orange shirt with pants and beautiful orange Crocs, super fashionable. Uh, but she handed it to me. I went into a room. She followed me in and I was just like standing there with 
the orange jumpsuit in my hands like okay like I literally was like okay I'm gonna change like are you gonna leave now and she's like no like I actually have to watch you change and I was like what excuse me and uh she just she made a joke which I laughed at the time but realized it's definitely not funny but she's like yeah it's just like orange is the new black and I was just like <laughs> not really because this is real and then she while I was completely naked she's like oh so this is awkward I'm so sorry but I have to ask you to squat and cough and I was like whoa that was a defining moment for me uh, personally I felt so violated I felt so bare and of course you know bodies are normal and natural and beautiful and being naked is normal and natural and beautiful but being naked when you are being looked upon as uh not an equal human with every and your your clothes aren't just stripped but your rights are stripped and you're within concrete walls under fluorescent lights with uh uh booking officers that you know are armed obviously because they have to be and you're in a situation where you can't get out of it you are stuck there and you must obey what they say or face the consequences and obviously i was not about to do that so uh squatting cough um change in being placed in a holding cell with cellmates who had been there for you know as little as a couple months to as much as over a year um who were it's it's you know it's so stereotypical it's typical but who were painting with using petroleum jelly and coloring books and cotton swabs like ear cotton swabs taking the petroleum jelly putting them on uh, the phone books, sorry, not coloring books, phone books to take the color off and painting. And this, you know, she, it was beautiful. It was totally beautiful. And she was painting sacred geometry, which I was like, what? But um, seeing that, um, seeing the shower that they all had to share and the reeking dink falling shower curtain um, and just the room again with no windows, concrete, um, the, the, door how it sounded when it closed uh having to use the bathroom and realizing that i'm going to have to use the bathroom on a stainless steel toilet and there were drugs inside the toilet they were like pills and i was like oh my god this is so real thankfully my cellmates were really sweet and they supported us 100 percent. most of them were actually native and a lot of them were like i wish we could be there with you but because of our actions we're here now but just know that if we were out there we would be right there with you supporting you and we have so much respect and gratitude for you guys for standing up for our water so thank you and and then hearing our brothers who were placed in the cell next to us and they were making beats on the wall and my friend and i who were arrested together we wanted to like make beats back with them because we we were trying to brighten our spirits up but once we started doing that our cellmates were like no 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 don't don't do that please don't do that you're gonna put us on lockdown so again everything that happened was so real and it was it was just a reminder that this is not a game and despite us being in high spirits at the time when i think back to it it's not a game and it's scary it's really really scary and there's a there is a psychological thing that happens when you're in uh when you're in jail and i'm now getting emotional about it for the very first time because it's it's almost giving me anxiety to think back about it and we were just in there for five hours some protectors had to be in there for so long so understand that being arrested is so powerful and what it can bring and the attention that it can bring someone snaps a picture of you and and puts it on social media is used in mainstream media that is so telling but understand that your actions leading up to your arrest will be absolutely looked upon in every minute detail when you go to court because that is what we faced um, with the state attorney 
They looked at every single action, and some people were yelling before that. You know, it, it, they, they were just feeling very high emotional about the situation, and that was used against them. Some people uh, were noticed by the police throughout the day, and that was used against them because they, they could detail and point out that, yes, this was the person, and yes, they did this, blah, blah, blah. I thankfully was sort of a ghost, and the police, they had no evidence. They, they, there was only one witness, and he only saw me in cuffs. He only remember seeing me in cuffs. He did not see the action that took place um, that led to my arrest. But really, really be mindful in that. And that's something I'm so grateful that I, um, I, could, I could see and take into account because it's a, if we can all share that knowledge and gift it with each other, then again, like my beautiful sister Havane Rio says, then we don't have to learn the hard way. So many of us learn the hard way. But if we can share the knowledge of what we learn, then we can we can learn in an easier way and we can do it in a better way. And then we can keep growing and growing. So know the power of arrests. Be conscious in your actions. If you know you're going to get arrested, try to be a ghost throughout the day because if the police can't see you, they can't put anything on you. Rem remember what you say because once you're in cuffs, you anything you say will be used against you that is not a joke and even throughout the day that will be used against you as well even if you cuss hold yourself accountable hold yourself at the highest level as if you are in representation of not just your family not just your ancestors but your soul make sure that you are showing the world that this is my soul these are the truths i live by and this is how i can portray my actions Arrests are so, so powerful. They are so scary. And they are so just, you know, it just leaves such impact on your own soul that some people take years, take decades, take even lifetimes, if you will, to to heal. Um, so arrests are powerful. Arrests are needed in certain situations um, and arrests are not to be taken lightly. Wow, Malia, thank you so much for recounting that traumatic experience and um, really detailing for us what it was like um, in, in jail and, and just all of the different pieces that move along with it. And, and I really appreciate the power that you put behind the arrest and to let people know that if this is something that they're choosing to do or whether or not they're choosing to do it, to really act with, the, this, with your soul and show up with integrity um, for so many different reasons. So thank you. And Heather, I'd like to pose the same question to you about the power of arrest. Um, also, this will be our last question. Emily, I'll, I'll let you have a closing as well. But just, Heather, if you want to talk about arrest or if there's something else that you would rather um, have as your closing statement, please, the floor is yours and however you'd like to use this time. Sorry, I got bumped off because I'm using my phone and it died and I wasn't paying attention, so sorry. Um, so I think I have, I have different feelings about arrests. Um, you know, I feel like they're, I've been a part of a, a whole bunch of different types of actions, ones that are like completely planned and the rest is planned. Like it's even pre-negotiated with like whoever. Like a great example is some of the rest of the White House on the Keystone Excel actions that happen. Um, you know, and there was some criticism around those arrests because like they were site and release realists. So what happened was, Folks, um, like if you know the White House, there's a spot right in front of it where you actually can't stop or sit down or stop moving. Like you have to keep moving. And it's where people take a lot of pictures, blah, blah, blah. It's like stupid law. Anyways, um, 
people would go up there and they would stand there with their banners and they wouldn't move and then the police would arrest them and then they were taken off site and then they were given a ticket and then they were released. So that's what I mean about site and release. It wasn't like they went through the whole process of being in jail and having to get bail and all those other things. Um, I think some challenges that I have around those arrests is like a lot of times they're really for show. They're not, they're not like because we're breaking a law that's wrong or we're showing or we're stopping, uh, we're stopping production or, you know, and, and it really goes back to this idea about strategy, right? And that, that's always been my criticism of these, these types of planned actions because oftentimes they're just for the media, right? They're just for a show to show an issue or to show something. And that has its own power. I'm not saying anything against it, but I think in our communities, we don't have the resources to fly a whole bunch of people to DC to do these actions, right? Um, we don't often have access to a lot of the resources that we need even to have training or do all of those other things, right? So a lot of times we're just reacting and we're doing something. And sometimes we don't know if we're gonna get arrested or not. And I think that's something that we always train folks for is that it doesn't matter what you're doing. We understand that the state is violent, that it's a police state that protects these resources. And that anything that we do on an escalated fashion puts us in some level of risk. And already being brown, being indigenous, we're already in a risk factor, right? And so it's just really thinking about what are the choices that you're making um, and what are the things that you're doing and how do you keep yourself safe, you know? And, and I really don't have all the answers to that because it really depends on what your community is like. You could have a really good relationship with the police where you're from, or you may have a really bad one, or we really don't know what's going to happen, right? And so it's just around that idea. Um, I think some of the things that are challenging is just like going back to like the Keystone actions, like they were planned. Um, you know, they didn't stop a, a, something from happening. They just highlighted an issue, which is great. That's fine. But when we talk about civil disobedience, like the definition is that you're breaking an unjust law. Right. And I think that's the difference also is that like that wasn't really an unjust law. It's just a random ass law not to stop in front of the White House. Right. And so I think there's different ways that people have strategically used arrest and actions. Um, and I think for a lot of the time with indigenous people, it's not like we ever intended to get arrested. And I think that's the biggest difference is that there's a lot of people in, in the, the large environmental movement and climate movement that talk about, oh, I've been arrested like five times and it's like a thing, a notch on their belt, right? That I've been to the X many actions and I've done all of this stuff, whereas I don't feel like the same connotation is in our communities, right? Because like for arrest, for us, it's oftentimes it's like guilty until proven innocent otherwise, right? And that goes back to this idea of racism and the police state and all of those things. So the questions I think are a little different depending on who's answering them, right? Um, I forgot that you asked me about IP3, and so it's the Indigenous People's Power Project. And, um, you know, it was created out of a demand, and that demand happened like in the mid 2000s. We've seen groups like Greenpeace and um, the Ruckus Society and other groups using direct action tactics, um, you know, in a variety of different ways. And we kind of question the Ruckus Society specifically, like why aren't you training our people? Why aren't indigenous people and people of color, why aren't you working with our communities? Because we're the front lines of a lot of these struggles, whether or not that's toxics or environmental issues or land issues or human rights violations, those are happening in our communities. You need to work with us. And so I feel like Ruckus was one of the few organizations that, that took that, um, that demand from people of color and indigenous communities to heart and their organization changed to meet that demand, not only um, by creating this, this IP3 project, but also like their boards changed, their staffs changed. Um, they went from being a male white led organization to predominantly women of color and indigenous folks involved in the organization. And so for me, that's something that I'm really proud of that they actually took our demand and applied it that's really cool because that's very rare um the indigenous people's power project like we took the tactics that they train and we kind of indigenized it i made it culturally relevant um and it's not to say that we know what's best for our communities or anything it's not like that at all um we really try and be principled around the way that we do trainings and we only go where we're asked and so like if you don't want us to come we won't show up but if you want us to show up 
we want to understand the best way that we can show up, right? And so it also means that we don't want you to be dependent on us as an organization because I find that a lot of the NGOs, the environmental organizations, create this codependency with our communities. And we want people to, to take what we know and the things that we understand and the experiences that we have and learn from us and then take them home with them. And so that you're never dependent on us. And then at some point, we're going to have a, a, a split in our relationship that we're going to keep going. And all the tools and all, all the knowledge that we have is left in that community and is culturally relevant, right? And so that we're not the ones always training and coming in and parachuting from outside, right? Because that's always the goal with us is not, not ever to stay somewhere forever. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, just being supportive of communities. And a good example is that um, we did some long-term um, support in the Klamis River Basin when they were fighting dam removal. And they're still fighting that campaign. But... Part of it was just helping them figure out their escalation plan, right? And I think about it in stairs. So, you know, they did all the things that a campaign should do. Um, they built relationships with allies that they, they never had before. They did petitions. They did lawsuits. They lobbied in D.C. and at the state legislature. They did everything, and nothing was moving. And so they did a series of strategic actions on Warren Buffett, who was a 50% shareholder in um, – the dams and own the, the power company that own the dams. And so they seen after those actions at, at the annual general meeting that Warren Buffett had, the first dam removal agreement came to their community about a month and a half later. So we know that like escalating and using, using these tactics strategically works. Um, but it's just figuring out for each community, like when do you escalate? How do you escalate? How do you do that in a way that's culturally relevant? And those are decisions I can't make. All I can do is help facilitate and help train folks. And that's all we do. And I think one of the things that, you know, I've been really thinking about in Canada is we have a little bit different history than the U.S. Um, in terms of, like, just really escalated actions. And so it's something that I've been thinking about in terms of training and things like that. Um, but that's who we are. And like I said, you know, I, I really feel like direct action really helps you get the goods in terms of, like, what it is you're seeking in your community. But, you know, if you just do actions all the time, you're also not going to be effective, right? Because if you're just doing actions and you don't actually have like a campaign or if you don't have solutions or if you don't have like this idea about what you want your community to look like as a whole picture, then, you know, the actions, you're just going to burn yourself out by doing all these amazing actions, right? And it goes back to that idea about the marches. Like if we just march and have protests and rallies all the time, like that's not going to be effective either, right? We really need to figure out like who has the power to give us what we want, right? And I think that's why the Divest campaigns were really awesome because they focused on the money and the money is where the power is, right? Who owns these companies? And really focusing on them. And then at the state level and the national level, like who, who are those decision makers that we need to target, right? And so that's kind of what would be the next natural step is going after those folks and really forcing them to be responsible for what they're doing, but also to uphold indigenous rights, right? And treaty rights and all of those things. Um, so I hope that's a little bit clear, and I really just wanted to say thank you for having us um, talk about this. This is a huge topic. I'm sure we could go on for days and days because uh, there's just so much to learn, and there's just so many experiences and things like that. So I just really want to thank you for the opportunity, and um, and just a quick update. Like IP3 is now um, in the process of becoming its own organization, and it's going through this process of, of, of kind of like a little bit of a rebirth. And so... Um, they're working on that and it's they'll be coming out i think in a couple months with like the, their new ip3 it's gonna have a new name and some new folks involved which is really amazing um the old ip3 one of the last things that we said in standing rock is that we wanted to do a training for trainers and we also wanted to do an art training for trainers so we're hoping that's going to happen in um denver um well at woodbine outside of denver in august and so that's also what we do is we want we want to train trainers all across the country because these like Standing Rock is not isolated right and so you know we can be useful in training young people and folks that are doing these actions with tools and with a bigger network of folks that are doing really amazing stuff and that's what we want to do too so that's just a quick update from us but yeah thank you so much
Well, thank you, Heather. And so, so everybody that's listening through Facebook Live right now and the participants in the webinar um, to, to look out for the new IP3 that's coming up in the next few months. And please stay tuned. And, you know, and Heather, please keep us informed so that we can support IP, the new, the rebirth of IP3 when it's ready for that support. And um, yes, please keep us updated. And Malia, I'd like to pass it to you and, um, you know, give you the chance to close out with your thoughts for this evening and grateful, so, so grateful to both of you for your work, your dedication, your courage, and just the, the vast amount of energy that you both are putting into the movement, the earth, and the people that really need this type of guidance to move forward because there are so many people who and i think even more since trump's been in office that are wanting to stand up but just don't know how and don't have the resources don't understand the depth that both of you do so thank you so much for for really sharing so many intricacies with us so that we can begin to really stand up and um and stand for this earth and, and the people that are that are being destroyed. So thank you and Malia, please for you, to you. Mahalo, 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 mahalo. I, I, I can't, you know, ex say that enough. Uh, mahalo Ayana for the wild spirit weavers and uh, really mahalo Heather to just hearing, hearing both of you speak and, and just being a part of this discussion really made me think back and made me it helped me reflect on um what has been my life uh through aloha aina work or protection work um as some would call it um and it's it's made me even so grateful to everyone that i've met to, that i have learned from through all the actions that i've experienced and um i really i, I can't express enough the power in sharing knowledge um, and, and taking a step back to listen too, because I think a lot of us are so ready to just jump and do so many things because we feel so strongly about it. And we just, we want so badly to just pass on that beautiful, beautiful uh, next generation, a healthy environment and a healthy society, healthy economy. Um, but I think right now, since, if, if you want to just go back to specifically Standing Rock, it was so intense that I feel that everybody who physically participated in it um, really needs time to just kind of calm down and listen, listen to what needs to happen in our own communities. And if, if that's something, I mean, we may, that the pipeline may have gone through and oil uh, may go through, it may not because it's not right now, but, that doesn't mean we lost. I think we won in so many more ways than just that one that we all thought was going to be considered winning. We won in the in, in the facts that we've made intense connections. We've learned so much. We've um, we've gathered information and are able now to hopefully bring that back to our communities because. You know, as Heather has said in so many of her beautiful discussions, there's so much happening, so much happening. And it's almost too much for all of us to keep track of and to really participate in. So if we can all go back to our communities, realize what needs to happen and what needs to change, what needs to evolve in a really good way and what needs to go back to how it used to be back in the day before things were considered to be ruined, um, then we can really start to feel like we're going at a sustainable base because that's important too. We have to be able to do this in a sustainable way. And that just that, that doesn't just mean economically, that doesn't just mean environmentally, that means within your own realm, within your own body, in your soul, your mental capacity, everything. We need to learn how to just take that breath and take a step back and listen because so many people have great things to say and uh, don't think that because they've experienced maybe less than you that they're not 
they that they don't have amazing knowledge to share so just mahalo on so many ends and i really appreciate it well malia that really got to the heart of this webinar is to educate ourselves um, really start with the knowledge so that when we do move in the world and we do move to action we're doing it from a place of integrity respect and knowledge about these topics so thank you both for helping so many people step into their work with integrity and i also want to thank for the wild and the spirit weavers gathering for helping to organize this event and the next webinar is on may 18th with joanna macy on um, keeping sane and active amid mass psychosis so tune in for that it will be on facebook live as well as on the zoom platform if you want to sign up and please um you know keep keep in touch with malia and heather and watch them as they continue this work and uh, as a community to support these incredible indigenous women organizers who are dedicating their life for a safer earth for all of us. So thank you all. Have a wonderful night and we will see you soon. Bye bye for now.